All right, welcome back to Science and Application with Eric Helms, episode four. Uh, that's pronounced say what? S A W E H. And today we're going to be talking about the science of motivation, because all of the fun stuff, you know, the the training programs, the nutrition, uh, all of these fun theories are nothing if you're not actually successful in pursuing it for the long term because as a natural athlete it's going to take a lot of time and effort to actually get to your goals uh, so we have to understand how do we stay in it for the long haul all right so first off i want to talk about a pretty interesting study that you probably haven't heard of because it's simply not in the realm of uh, nutrition or science it's uh, a cool study by fishbach and Choi from 2012 called when thinking about goals undermines goal pursuit and really, uh, this is a study that's basically asking the question of what's the best way to think about achieving our goals? And uh, do we have it backwards in the fitness indus industry sometimes, emphasizing uh, these concrete uh, goals that are, are often external in some way? Uh, and is there a better way to go about engendering long-term success uh, and, and quality and quantity of effort? Uh, so basically, this is the difference between uh, seeing something you're doing, let's say bodybuilding, as an instrument to achieve a goal versus seeing uh, the bodybuilding, in this case, as inherently rewarding, okay? Um, that means, are, are, you, are you getting under the bar every day and are you lifting the weights every day and managing your nutrition because you want to achieve uh, a certain physique uh, or, or a certain total uh, or a title uh, primarily? Um, or do you see that's something that you enjoy doing? It's a part of uh, who you are, what you like to do. It's, it's, uh, it's something that you do uh, because it is inherently rewarding to you. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, the different effects of, of seeing it one way or the other. So first in this study, in the, in the introduction, they talk about a very interesting study which kind of sets the tone uh, where back in the 70s, a group of researchers took children Children who are already drawing. So they drew for fun. They, that's just what they did. You know, if left alone to their own pursuits, they'd go get the crayons, get a piece of paper, and they would draw for fun, right? So what the, uh, the, the researchers did was they started rewarding the kids for drawing. So they'd finish a drawing, which they weren't even instructed to do. They were just doing it on their own. They'd say, hey, great job, Timmy. Here's a reward. And what they found out was that after they stopped rewarding the children, a very strange thing happened. These children who were drawing on their own, once they were given rewards, they were less likely to keep drawing. So it changed the motivation in their mind once they started receiving an external reward. What was once initially an inherently rewarding, rewarding activity then became an instrument to achieve a goal once they were given a reward. So kind of sad when you think about it, that's something that the kids really enjoyed doing, they would stop doing without some kind of external reward. And that is essentially kind of the basis by which this, uh, this study was done. Uh, so this study was actually on four different activities. It's actually a grouping of studies. Uh, and they looked at four different types of activities, uh, origami folding, treadmill running, uh, doing yoga, and also flossing your teeth. Uh, and they chose a broad range of studies to really kind of show that this is an inherent part of the human psyche uh, rather than being specific to a certain goal. So I'm just going to summarize the treadmill running side of it a little bit because it's the kind of the closest thing uh, to, to, you know, lifting weights and working out um, because it's most relevant to, to this. But they found similar results in, in all four types of activities. Uh, so essentially what they did was they had uh, a group of over 100 exercisers, I believe about 70 were women, about 40 were men, and they were you know, already going to the gym, already training, and they essentially just asked them two questions and then grouped them into two groups. They asked them, you know, how much exercise do you plan on doing today? And then they found out how much they actually did. So they, they measured this in minutes spent on the treadmill. And the differences in the two groups is that one, they told them to focus on things such as the feeling of their body and the feeling of being healthy and enjoying the process of actually running on the treadmill. And the other group, they told them to focus on the goal of what would occur from, from running on the treadmill long term. You know, if you keep uh, staying consistent with your, your treadmill running, you will eventually, you know, get to this great level of fitness. So an interesting thing happened. Uh, the group that was focused on the goal, they predicted that they would run farther than they actually did. So they would, they would actually say, I'm going to run a lot farther. Uh, they'd say, I'm going to run for 45 minutes on average. Uh, but then they ended up running about 10 minutes less 
than they expected. Now something very different happened in the other group. The other group, while they didn't set quite as high of a goal, they did say they said they'd run maybe 38 minutes. They actually surpassed uh, the amount that they predicted. So they ran about 10 minutes longer than they expected versus the other group that ran about 10 minutes less. So interestingly enough, the group that wasn't focused on the goal of achieving fitness did more fitness activity. Uh, and this is an interesting thing. Uh, and, and there's a lot of speculation as to why that may have occurred. But the same thing happened with yoga. The same thing happened with origami folding. And the same thing happened with even flossing your teeth. So the idea is that, that by focusing on an external reward that is often uh, much further in the future, uh, it, it makes the actual activity itself inherently less enjoyable. And other research uh, has, has suggested that when you are focused only on an external goal, an activity becomes more chore-like. And you can even hear this when you talk to some high-level professional athletes or professional actors who originally started it for the love, uh, but it definitely changes for them and they don't get as much uh, enjoyment out of the activity in the long run. So, so really what we're talking about here is, is there a place for both? Um, and, and I would argue that there is, and so would the authors. They talked about initial versus long-term motivation, or as they put it, intention versus pursuit. Uh, because it's very difficult to, to have someone focus on the process before they've even started the process. So for example, if you want to get someone in the gym to, to buy a gym membership and to, and to start training and to actually be committed to something, they need something to motivate them. And what motivates someone at the initial phase of, of starting a, a new journey uh, may be that external reward down, down the line. They have something concrete and they can focus on it because at this point they truly can't focus on the process because they've yet to start. So while it may be appropriate at the beginning of a, uh, of a time period where you're working with a client or when you're starting a new um, activity to focus on where you eventually be. If you want to be successful in following it, once you start, then maybe that's when you want to focus more on the process itself uh, to keep you motivated and to keep you enjoying it and focusing less on the, the final end point. So let's talk about motivational shifts in bodybuilding. Let's bring it home for us and then I'll kind of sum it all up with a nice hierarchy. In bodybuilding, rarely do we have people who start lifting weights and managing their fitness specifically, sorry, they're managing their nutrition specifically for the goal of getting on stage and competing in bodybuilding. Most of the time, people start lifting weights and start paying attention to their nutrition for other reasons. It may be external, it may not, but most of the time when someone has lifted weights for long enough, a few years, they have some of that initial enjoyment. And once they decide, I want to get on stage, it's just like when you start giving the reward to children who were, who were drawing initially. All of a sudden, now you get a second or third place trophy, or maybe you don't get a trophy, but you now you're hunting for that trophy, or you're hunting for that pro card, or you're hunting for that pro win, or that top five placing to qualify for Worlds, or that top three at Worlds, or maybe even trying to be the world champion. Uh, once you start training for the win in bodybuilding, this can, just like any other human doing anything else, start taking away from your enjoyment. So I think it's very important to try to keep that love of the process as a bodybuilder. Because when you go from recreational bodybuilder to competitive bodybuilder, it's very easy to get caught up in the drive for achievement. And unfortunately, and objectively, we can say that once you start focusing purely on the achievement, you actually get worse at achieving your goals. And it becomes more chore-like, and you have to rely more on driving yourself to do it versus being drawn to do it because you love it. So that's one of the reasons why we're not just 3D muscle, but we're 3D muscle journey. Yes, you need dedication, you need desire, you need discipline, but when you're focused on the journey, it's so much easier to derive discipline, to find uh, that dedication and to keep your desire, and you get much more payback for each one of those qualities than if you were purely focused on dedication, desire, and discipline to win. So the journey is what gets you to the final destination. Uh, and if you focus too much on the final destination, it actually makes it harder to get there, as ironic as that is. Uh, but we know this from uh, the science of human motivation. So essentially, this is what we're talking about. I don't think you should completely try to eliminate the goals of winning. Um, and so often, we do, do focus on self-improvement. But really, we need a solid foundation of enjoying the process. 
So here I'm presenting this not as a pyramid because I know I've presented plenty of pyramids in my time, <laughs> but as a hierarchy. So if your goal is to have long-term success in bodybuilding, to be doing this when you're Masters 1, Masters 2, and to follow the example set forth by guys like Jeff Alberts or even Marshall Johnson, who are successful in competing at a high level in their 40s and 50s, believe it or not, focusing on, the, on winning itself only is probably going to have you burn out earlier and lose your love of the sport. So often we will suggest, hey, just try to beat yourself. It's you versus you. Uh, you always just want to try to beat the man or the woman in the mirror. And I think that's great, but we also have to realize that there comes a point in time where perhaps we can't beat ourselves anymore. And do you want to be the person when you're in your 40s or 50s and you find you're struggling to improve and you may be even backsliding towards all of a sudden you stop lifting weights? What a tragedy, you know, to spend 30 years doing something you love and then to stop just because you can't beat yourself. Uh, and hopefully, after 30 years of lifting, you've developed a love for the process or why are you even doing it? And it's important to develop this, this, this love for the process because in a very, very real sense, lifting weights and staying fit and focusing on your, on your nutrition becomes more important the older you get as your health and your body starts to fight you more and more and you can't just rely on your youth to get you by. So the last thing you want is to fall out of this healthy pursuit of bodybuilding uh, as you get older. So that's why it's great to focus on beating yourself, but also as you get more mature and lift for longer and focus on your nutrition, it's very important to just enjoy the process itself. And that's hopefully something uh, that we try to be good examples for. But this is always something we have to, as individuals, even those of us who've been lifting more than 10 years and competing uh, for many, many years, we have to focus on trying to remember this, that it's important to love getting under the bar. It's important to enjoy the process of competition, of preparing for competition. So really, you want this hierarchical relationship where the foundation of your motivation is enjoying the process. From there, yes, a healthy amount of focus on just beating yourself, and then that cherry on top, sure, nothing wrong with going for the win, but never let it be nearly as important as self-improvement, and definitely not as important as process enjoyment. Now, it's not easy to just turn your mind around and think differently, but this is where you want to start pushing your mind towards and thinking differently about your training. So remember, everybody, if you want to stay in the game long term, if you don't want to just compete for five years, burn out, and then look back on where you were and just can't understand why you've changed so much and don't even want to get in the weight room, you've got to enjoy the process. From there, focus on improving, and then from there, you can focus on the win. But remember, it's all about enjoying what you do. Love your life and you'll keep succeeding. And that was a weird end, but I'm going to go with it. All right, folks, that's it. Remember the motivational hierarchy for long-term bodybuilding success. Enjoy the process, and I will see you next time on Say What?